All right, I have 6.02. I think that's a good time. Uh, my name is Paige Therian. I am Audubon's Development and Communications Associate, and I welcome you for joining us tonight. I will be the moderator, and as you know, we'll be hearing from uh, Priscilla De La Cruz, Audubon Senior Director of Government Affairs, and Dr. Charles Clarkson, Audubon Director of Avian Research. Um, we will have formal introductions in just a minute where you'll you'll hear from them as well as our executive director, Lawrence Tapp. But first, I just want to do a couple housekeeping items. So as you saw, we are recording the meeting and this will be shared with everyone here. Uh, welcome to the couple of people that just came in, just doing housekeeping items at the moment. Um, so yes, the recording will be shared with everyone here, everyone who registered and we'll also upload it to YouTube. So you'll have access to review it and share it with people who couldn't make it. Um, and yeah, we just ask that you remain muted unless you're called upon. Um, we have Jeff Hall as our IT person in case you are having trouble with anything, you can message him privately in the chat and you can access the chat down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, yep, he just said hi, so you should be able to click on the little red bubble that just popped up and access the chat that way. Um, let's see. That's about it for housekeeping. Welcome to the couple people that just joined us. So our itinerary tonight, as I said, we're going to hear from Lawrence Taft, our executive director, in just a moment, and then we will have some quick intros from Priscilla and Charles. And after that, we're gonna do about 20 minutes of uh, discussion. So it's gonna be Priscilla and Charles going back and forth, answering uh, five or six questions that I'll be asking them. And these questions were kind of formed using the questions that, um, that you, our viewers, submitted in advance. And we distilled them down to five or six questions using the common threads or common themes that um, that were present in all of your questions. Uh, following the description, the discussion, sorry, we're gonna have a Q&A. So that's gonna be the last 15 to 20 minutes. And we just ask that you hold your questions until then and um, put, uh, you're welcome to put them in the chat throughout the panel discussion, but uh, yeah, they will be held until the last 20 minutes or so. Um, mainly because we may already have your question planned for the discussion portion. Um, so feel free to put your questions in the chat. And yeah, once again, if you have trouble accessing that, um, just reach out to one of us and we'll try and help you out. Uh, sorry, let's get started. Uh, Larry, you're on mute, but Welcome okay, you to I'm give you your remarks. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, you're gonna set, share the screen, correct, Paige? Okay. Uh, welcome everybody. And thank you, Paige, for setting this up and organizing it. It's uh, very exciting to have our first town hall meeting, virtual town hall meeting. We have over 40 people I see who have tuned in. So this would be a big gathering of people. Uh, and I wanna welcome you all to it. <clears throat> I'm just gonna be very briefly get started because really you're here to hear Charles and Priscilla. But I, I just thought I'd back up a little bit and just kind of review what Audubon's about and what we're trying to do. And then they will take it from there. Yeah, as you can see, the Audubon's mission is pretty simple to protect birds, other wildlife and their habitats through conservation, education and advocacy for the benefit of people and all of life. And you know, we have very big ed environmental education program that we do every year with thousands of kids, school kids. <clears throat> Even during COVID, we still reached out to schools via the internet and these kind of presentations. And so we're continuing that. And of course, um, we manage an awful lot of land and 15 refuges, which are very important during COVID uh, for people to just get outside and to hike. So uh, those are things that are going on. Next slide, please, Paige. During COVID, next slide. Okay, during, during COVID, we actually were able to uh, 
conduct a strategic planning exercise. We had done a lot of interviews and surveys just prior to March of 2020. Uh, and we adopted a new plan in, in the summer of 2020. And we came up with four really important overarching goals. One was to protect birds and their habitats to support species survival and adaptation through climate change. Another was to mobilize people from all backgrounds to take action on climate change. Fourth, third one was to advocate for local and state government to rapidly invest in climate change responses. And finally, to transform Audubon into an inclusive climate change action organization. Now, you look at that and you can see what's running through that is climate change as being a very important topic, kind of the complicating thing to all of our work. Um, you know, when you think about the protection of birds and habitats, fragmentation comes to mind, but climate change just exacerbates that. And also people's quality of life, <clears throat> um, you know, climate change creates all kinds of problems. So we're going to, with this new strategic plan, we really started to decide we wanted to ramp up our understanding of the role of our refuges uh, with, uh, you know, in how they function especially for bird populations, and also start to reach out and really get more active in engaging other communities rather than just kind of the folks who would always kind of follow us. How do we get out there and engage other communities and really try to make some serious things that Audubon can be effective on with uh, regarding climate change and policy. So I'm very proud and very happy to introduce to you two new st staff members at Audubon, Charles Clarkson, who is our Director of Avian Research, and Priscilla De La Cruz, our Senior Director for Government Affairs. So I'm going to turn the rest of the show over to them. Thank you for coming. Thank you for watching. Hi, everyone. It's really great to see some familiar faces and some new faces and also some, some new names as well. I'm really excited to be part of the Audubon team. I will walk us through about three slides. I'll be brief um, and then I will hand it over to Charles before we get into our panel discussion. Thanks, Paige. So I typically like to start my um, policy discussions with this slide just really focused on Audubon's mission that Larry just described and walk, walked us through, but also the science and what the latest climate crisis news is. Because for me, working um, to lead our advocacy department and really forming the policy priorities of Audubon, it has to be driven by science. And it also has to be centered around our mission um, to protect birds, wildlife, and their habitats, and doing this um, through our efforts in conservation, education, and advocacy, and ensuring that we are also continuing to do the work that we do for the benefit of all living things, including people. Uh, so I like to start with the science, and I, I like to point us to the latest news and what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is telling us about the science, and this is the IPCC report. Um, and I will also apologize in advance. I'm a bit nasally. Um, I'm fighting through a cold. Um, I am feeling slightly better um, to, to be able to join you all today. So I am excited about that. Um, so when thinking about the work that Audubon does and how we carefully follow the many threats that birds and all other wildlife face, as Larry mentioned, climate change is the biggest threat. And for birds, especially migratory birds, so when thinking about how to shape our policy priorities, how can we best leverage our influence and our expertise to really position the state to address the climate crisis? And as Larry also described, our current strategic plan really um, leads, provides that framework that we need to do the work around climate action over the next five years. Um, and we know that the science is, is intensifying, that climate change um, is intensifying and it's also accelerating and it's really threatening um, our, our wildlife, our ecosystems, and it's also um, facing and also our environmental justice communities, our frontline communities who are often low income communities and communities of color are bearing the brunt of the carbon pollution. So how can we work on solutions that are going to mitigate the impacts of climate 
climate change, but also ensure that we are adapting because there are changes that are irreversible, like sea level rise. And we really have to make sure that the ocean state is well positioned to protect um, our, its wildlife and its people against the threat of climate change. Next slide, please. So when thinking about the science and thinking about the climate crisis that is accelerating, um, this is one of the key reasons why Audubon has played a key role in advocating for immediate large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions to help avoid the worst impacts of climate change. So as we've reported, um, we've, we've had a victory over the past year in the passage of the Act on Climate that truly sets the framework for how we're going to reduce emissions and get to net zero by 2050. And what's great about that landmark piece of legislation that was just signed into law in April is that there was wide, wide, wide range of supporters calling for an act on climate, really ensuring that we're working on addressing the climate crisis and that we're also centering the voices that are going to be most impacted by the climate crisis. And that, as I mentioned, includes environmental justice and frontline communities and also frontline workers. And how do we really craft the solutions that are going to position the state to take advantage of the investments on climate. Um, and that includes both mitigation and also adapting to climate change. So through our efforts at Audubon, we're going to continue to prioritize act, the Act on Climate legislation. Now that it's law, we have to work on really ensuring its successful implementation. So there are, will be various opportunities for you all to also engage in this process. And from Audubon's perspective, we're gonna be looking at the requirements of the Act on Climate. So it's not only getting about, not only about getting to net zero by 2050, but how are we going to meet the targets, the interim targets of 45% reductions by 2030, 80% by 2040? And also how are we going to hold the state accountable to ensure that um, these binding targets are met? And next slide, please. So I wanted to provide you with an overview of our 2021 legislative priorities. Um, Matt Kerr, who was our former policy director, now retired, led the effort um, in her previous role um, and guiding us through the success of seeing some of these legislative initiatives through passage. And as I mentioned, that included the Act on Climate. Now we're focused on implementation. And I will say one area um, for Audubon um, to follow closely is how that plan is implemented. Not only do we want robust engagement and transparency, but we also want to ensure that as we're looking at plans being updated, for example, the law calls for a um, greenhouse gas emission reduction plan of 2016 to be updated by the end of 2022. Well, we don't just want a simple update, right? We wanna make sure that this report is very robust in its nature and that the plan is more expansive in areas related to land and forest conservation. How are we going to protect our, our, our resilient forests? How are we going to ensure that we're addressing the tension around solar siting? Um, with the urgent need of climate change and how are we also going to center environmental justice. So we're looking for a report that's really going to provide the needed framework for the additional requirements of the Act on Climate, which will require a strategic implementation plan every five years starting in 2025. Um, and the Act on Climate really paints the way for, I think, a lot of the other policy priorities that you will see Audubon engaged in. So I won't um, go into too much detail because I think we're going to cover a lot of ground here. Um, but other key policies that I will point out that we're seeing through implementation also include the Forest Conservation Act. This was a priority of Audubon last year. Um, we wanted to ensure that um, we are looking at the values of forests and that we're looking at how to maintain um, the numerous benefits that forests provide. Um, so now we're looking at the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, DEM, to um, implement a forest conservation commission. Um, so stay tuned for that. I think this is going to help provide a vehicle um, that will provide additional recommendations as to how we assess the value of forests and how can we best support private land owners um, and help them conserve their forests. Um, and then I, I think we're gonna have plenty of time to talk about solar siting. I've already 
hinted at the fact that we need solar siting reform. We need a comprehensive approach for how we're going to address this tension between protecting our resilient forests and also um, ensure that we are deploying the renewable energy that we need to meet the um, Act on Climate implementation that is required by law and ensuring that we're facing the climate crisis. And then last but not least, what was part of our priority, and I, I foresee it continuing to be um, at the center of our advocacy work, is ensuring that we are protecting pollinators and their habitat. So we will continue to move forward with working with DEM and legislators to help really regulate the use of neo, um, neonics. Um, and this is a class of insecticides that affect the central nervous system of insects that have been linked to pollinator decline, and this is worldwide. So how can we ensure that we are protecting pollinators that are critical to the health of our ecosystems and ensure that we are removing these um, narrow toxins that impact birds, wildlife, and also humans, um, and ensuring that we're regulate, regulating the use of those harmful pesticides and also banning them um, where and how we can. Um, and then to the right, just quickly pointing out, there are many other policies that we support um, and we're part of a, a large community of environmental groups through the Environment Council of Rhode Island um, and also working with labor through a initiative called Climate Jobs Rhode Island. Um, so I will stop there. I'm looking forward to the discussion and I am sure I am over my five minutes. Um, so Charles, over to you. I'm just Thank you very much, Priscilla. Back up the slides, sorry. <laughs> Go for it. Okay. So okay. welcome everybody. Thanks so much for taking time out of your evening to join us. This is uh, this is fantastic. I'm so happy that there are so many people excited about these things that we're doing at Audubon and the direction that we're we're moving. Um, it's it's much needed. Uh, unfortunately, I consider this kind of an all hands on deck period for conservation. We've, we've kind of blown right past those periods in which few people working through the night can get much accomplished on their own. This is a, a period in which a lot of, of cooperation between multiple agencies needs to occur in order for conservation to be done correctly. Um, by way of an introduction, my name is Charles Clarkson. For those of you who know me from the Bird Atlas, um, I did coordinate the Rhode Island Bird Atlas for five years, cycled off of that as the grant and into this new role as the director of avian research for Audubon. Um, and I'm extremely excited about the upcoming research that we plan across our refuge network and then hopefully beyond that to other agencies and land trusts in the state and forging more partnerships also at the state and regional level to try to come up with these very cohesive regional conservation plans for birds all across not just Rhode Island but the Northeast. Um, so I've been in my role now since September 13th was my first day and on day one I started a fairly comprehensive analysis of baseline data just to understand what it is that we know about our refuge complex. You know we manage over 9,500 acres of land between Rhode Island and one refuge in Massachusetts. And it's really important to get an understanding of not just what birds are there, but what habitats are there as well, because birds and habitats are inextricably linked to one another. And so we have been performing a fairly thorough habitat analysis, as well as dredging up all of the information coming from recent sources of information, such as the Bird Atlas, to understand how birds use our refuge complex, both during the breeding season, um, but also during the, the winter season as well, and, and during periods of passage um, in migration. Moving forward, these are the six kind of major bullet points that are going to serve as the guiding framework for how I will uh, work into the future, 2022 and beyond at Rhode Island Audubon. Uh, we are looking to establish a long-term monitoring protocol across all of our properties. And so data will be collected at the publicly accessible as well as the non-public refuges on what species of bird utilize those refuges for breeding, wintering, and migratory habitats, uh, what resources they rely on. So hand in hand with the bird data that we collect, we're going to be collecting habitat-based data as well, very similar to the bird atlas. So for those of you, I'm sure there are many on the call that 
that have contributed in some aspect to the Bird Atlas as a volunteer, you're probably going to be familiar with the protocol that we develop for this, uh, this research that we're going to be undertaking. In addition to that, it's really important for us to understand more about our refuges in terms of how they are supplying the requisite requirements for these birds. You know, birds have an exceptionally energetically costly life, uh, and that's that's across the entirety of the year. And so understanding small parcels versus large parcels, whether or not there's an edge effect that could put species breeding in some of our smaller parcels at risk of increased rates of predation, for example, those are questions that are going to be answered with the use of more targeted scientific research projects to include the establishment of acoustic monitoring stations in some of our Audubon parcels that might house some of our rare habitat types in the state. So getting a feeling for what species use these more rare habitats and what effects um, the edge or urbanized and fragmented habitats have on these on these parcels. I also am working uh, currently with eBird. Many of you are eBird users, and so you're familiar with the platform. And I'm working with them to establish a protocol and a portal for Rhode Island Audubon specific observations to be downloaded that will be collected in a very scientifically rigorous way so that I can apply the same data analysis techniques that we use for the Bird Atlas to the form of, of data collection and analysis that we'll, we'll be moving forward with at Audubon. Something that I, I really look forward to doing actually is developing a list of responsibility birds. This is something I've, I've kind of uh, borrowed from the Vermont Audubon Society. The idea being that for a large number of species that breed in New England, 90% of their entire global breeding distribution falls here in New England. And so they're not found anywhere else on Earth. And so for many of these birds, while they might not currently be in decline, it is our responsibility as stewards of the environment to do what we can to ensure that the habitats they require stay in perpetuity for them to use. So developing a list of species that utilize our refuges with regularity, uh, most of which aren't necessarily going to be in decline, is going to be one of the uh, key uh, kind of key cornerstones of, of the research that we'll be doing so that we have additional information gathered for this list of responsibility birds that we can then uh, perform management actions to ensure that they continue to be a facet of the Rhode Island landscape. Um, number five, establishing ourselves as a scientific partner, both through uh, co-production here in the state by working with other state agencies like the DEM and other land trusts, but also regionally. So working with other state Audubon societies as well as universities throughout New England becomes really important for allowing us to be cohesive with the amount of scientific research we're doing and ensuring that the data we're collecting here are comparable to the data that are being collected across New England um, and even into southern Canada because a lot of our our partners throughout the region are, are interested in the exact same metrics of conservation that we are. And then lastly, something that Audubon does so well, so I'm really just happy to be coming into the fold here, is their outreach and communication to their huge membership. Um, and I really hope to infuse a lot of science communication into that outreach. Uh, in, my, in my personal belief, I think one of the biggest gaps that exist that needs to be bridged is between science and the general public. Um, a lot of information comes in on a constant basis about conservation needs of wildlife populations, about um, habitat destruction, climate change, and not much of it is disseminated in an effective way to the general public. So in my new role, I hope through the management of both a blog and a newsletter to be able to reach out to all of you and beyond uh, and explain some of the newest research coming out, what it's telling us about bird populations, what we can do from a practical standpoint to help those populations. And then when we do our work here at Audubon, communicating effectively the, um, the actual results of those studies to you so that you understand and become vested um, as a steward for Rhode Island wildlife in, in the work that we're doing. So that's just a very brief introduction uh, to, to my plan moving forward. And I may have already answered some of those questions that are being, going to be asked as part of this town hall, but I am happy now to kind of kick it back over to um, Paige and let her take the helm and, and, and start with the town hall.
Thank you, and thank you both. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you so far, so we're really excited to have you on board. So like I said, we have about 20 minutes for um, the discussion, and then we'll move on to a Q&A. Uh, so our first question is, what are a Audubon's avian research and policy goals or top priorities for 2022? Why? Please include any federal priorities too, if any. And obviously kind of already covered some of these, but um, really looking, looking ahead to 2022 and what may already be happening behind the scenes. So uh, Priscilla, if you wanna go first. Sure, happy to go first. Uh, so I've alluded to some of those um, priorities that um, will inform our le legislative agenda going into 2022. And I think a lot of it is just picking up on the amazing work um, that the advocacy department was doing last year and making sure that we're seeing that through fruition in 2022. Um, so for example, just quickly going down the list again, um, I talked a lot about solar siting. Um, last year, there was a focus in closing, um, we refer to a 10 megawatt loophole um, where we were seeing um, small solar farms being co-located next to each other. Um, and then we were seeing further um, further impacts to, to forests um, by navigating that loophole. And just, you know, you'll have one, one parcel um, on this side of the road and then another one on the other, which that is still something that we want to address. Um, but one of my goals um, uh, for Audubon going into 2022 is that we're working on a comprehensive approach and really addressing um, solar siting, that we're looking at this in a very comprehensive way and thinking about um, right now, um, the reality is that it is cheaper to develop in um, open forest space. So how can we flip those economics? How can we look at our, our successful um, renewable energy programs and really ensure that we're incentivizing developing in the areas that we we define as preferred um, when thinking about um, gravel pits, when thinking about, of course, rooftop and thinking about parking lots um, and putting solar canopies there. We're thinking about brownfields. So again, we have to go through this process of building consensus um, with the um, environmental advocates, developers, legislators, and really making sure that we're defining those critical um, forest areas that we do need to protect. Act, um, because forests do play an essential role in helping us also meet our act on climate targets. There's there's benefits of carbon sequestration. So we really have to address this balance. So I see that as a top priority for us. And I also see that as an important priority in helping us implement the act on climate. If we are going to move off a fossil fuel based economy and deploy more renewable energy, we really need to figure out what that balancing act is. Um, and also, in addition to those two policies, um, looking at our continued work on protecting pollinators um, and working with state legislators in regulating um, harmful, harmful pesticides and really figuring out how can we get um, a bill that we have been working on the past couple, couple of years across the finish line. So in the coming weeks, we'll be having meetings with um, the Farm Bureau, with the Rhode Island um, DEM, um, policymakers, and some of our um, partner advocates to really ensure that we can move something forward. And also, I should mention that a key partner has been the city of Providence, who's really leading by example and saying, you know, for our large scale commercial use and managing our parks, um, our, our properties under the parks department, we're not going to use harmful pesticides. And Audubon has been a key part of that work in helping to inform a report um, in pesticide management and best practices, leading to the launch of a Providence pesticide-free campaign. So we want to do more of that work of showing that example um, and really making the, the public aware of why we need to protect pollinators and how essential that is to protecting the health of our ecosystem, but also in protecting um, not only birds, wildlife, but also humans from these neurotoxins. Um, so I foresee that continuing to be a priority and also um, last but not least, environmental justice. I've mentioned um, environmental justice several times and really looking at that 
as uh, how do we center that in our policy approaches and how can we as Audubon be better allies to environmental justice and frontline groups that are working on the ground um, to protect their, their communities from carbon pollution. Um, so I'll stop there. Charles, over to you. Wow. I think this uh, town hall needs to be like three hours long. I don't think one is enough. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to talk too much about this specific point because I know you have other questions to ask us. I'll just add in, you know, a lot of of what Priscilla uh, just talked about is is going to be aided by the information coming in from the research that we're doing. Um, you know, the bottom line is Rhode Island is the second most urban state in the country, and yet 50% of it is forested. And solar siting is inordinately important in a situation like that, because you don't want to take this core patch of oak hardwood forest that is so important for our breeding bird population in the state and turn it into a solar field. Um, so it, addressing solar siting and responsible solar siting is going to be a huge interplay between advocacy and the work that Priscilla is doing and the research that we're doing to understand more thoroughly which species are so heavily reliant on these habitats, particularly from targeted studies done on our refuge complex. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is for, from my perspective, for what I have in store for 2022 is that we need to understand a lot more of, of the baseline data uh, from our refuges. So although I did dredge up information that we had collected during the bird atlas, you have to understand that we surveyed only 20 of the Audubon refuges as, as part of the, that bird atlas effort. And, and that the total terrestrial landmass of those, of those 20 refuges amounts to six tenths of 1% of the terrestrial landmass in the state. So 0.6% of all the land in the state of Rhode Island was surveyed um, during the bird atlas for, for Audubon refuges. And yet 49% of all the birds found in the entire state were found on that 0.6%. So that, that tells you a lot about how conserved open space in general supports breeding bird populations. What we need to new, understand now is a more specific question, which is, you know, which species are thriving, what habitats they're requiring, and what is the minimum patch size that these birds need to do what they do successfully, all right? So how much land do we need to provide to these birds? Um, we found rare species in our state in this six-tenths of one percent of all the survey area. You know, Canada warbler, which is a species that is predicted by the Audubon Society, the international, the National Audubon Society, to actually, because of climate warming, move its range out of U United States of America altogether. I mean, this will be a species that leaves our country as a whole due to the pending warming climate. And yet we found a handful of them breeding on Audubon refuges. So understanding where the strongholds are for these species is going to feed into this greater system of both scientific understanding, conservation, and advocacy. So everything that Priscilla does is going to be informed by the work that we do and everything that she is fighting so hard for uh, in terms of environmental justice, in terms of responsible solar siting is going to be things that I have in the back of my head as I'm going out and collecting data so that I know that I'm collecting data in a way that will help answer some of these really big and important questions for Rhode Island moving forward. Thank you both. I'm very excited to see the interplay between that. So our next question, why does climate change pose the biggest threat to birds, wildlife, and their habitat? Um, I am, I, I will take that on and I will start by saying, um, echoing what Charles and Paige have said, I'm so excited to be working um, with Charles. I, I think that making sure that we are mobilizing and um, educating the general public on these issues will only reinforce the advocacy work that we're doing. And of course we want um, our advocacy approach to be informed by science. So it, it's really great. Um, I first met Charles um, back, uh, I think several years ago when, when you were presenting the bird atlas to the Environment Council of Rhode Island and here we are working together. So I think this is a very exciting time. 
Um, but in terms of going back to, to the science um, and the threat that climate change um, poses, and I guess I've, I've answered the question there, very leading question that we've, we've answered that climate change does pose the biggest threat um, to birds, wildlife, um, to our economy, through to our livelihoods, to our communities. So really ensuring that Audubon remains front and center in, in addressing the climate crisis through our advocacy efforts is, is, is one of my top priorities and will continue to be. There's so many moving facets to um, the Act on Climate Implementation. And I want to ensure that as we're talking about addressing the climate crisis, that we're not forgetting about forest conservation that we're not forgetting about protecting pollinators and the importance of investing in climate resiliency and adaptation approaches and doing this in a very integrated way. Um, so I think that Audubon plays a very key role um, in reminding the state of, of the threat that climate crisis um, poses for all species, including birds and, 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 and people. Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, in my mind, like the holistic um, picture of climate change is is quite dramatic when you consider how many proximate drivers there are uh, regarding the, the decline of so many wildlife species, principally birds, is what we're we're focusing on here um, tonight. And you know. There was a time when the ultimate driver of, of bird decline could be identified. DDT is a classic example of it. And through hard work and legislative action, we were able to reverse that effect and see populations of birds rebound as a result of banning this harmful chemical that was being applied liberally to our landscape. It's not like that anymore. Climate change is a is a really massive problem that has fueled multiple drivers that have all contributed to the decline of wildlife species. So you're not just talking about one avenue that can be addressed and the benefits of of that level of conservation can be measured. You know, the the bird populations are suffering as a result from habitat loss and degradation, uh, a rising sea level, warming climate, shifting habitats, changing phenology of the world around them. And, and all of those things need to be addressed. There's not one driver that is going to be contributing the most to avian decline. And so unfortunately, that's why I consider this kind of an all hands on deck period for conservation. It's there are multiple fronts that we're battling. You know, there are thousands of birds dying off during southbound fall migration as a result of forest fires in the West. And we're documenting that now. And that's not been um, a phenomenon that we've that we've known about for decades. And so now all of a sudden it's something that we have to consider um, on top of species like the salt marsh sparrow uh, that is in decline and is projected to go extinct because of rising sea levels, pinching this particular species in between a rising sea and a hardened landscape uphill um, in, the, in the upland uh, habitats. So the, the questions you ask are going to be very species specific because every species is being impacted differently and the suite of those factors that are contributing to species decline is just getting bigger and moving faster. If you think the, the pace like uh, Priscilla alluded to earlier, the pace of climate change is is quickening. You know, things are starting to move forward much faster now uh, than they ever have before. Background extinction rates, which is the the natural rate of extinction, is 100 times higher now than it was 50, 60 years ago. Um, and so we are faced with this really uh, dire situation in which. We need impassioned people doing lots and lots of hard work to try to stave off the declines. The bottom line is birds have been on this planet for 160 million years, and they have been slowly changing alongside an, a, an environment, a climate that has also been relatively slow to change. And now they're being faced with this very rapid change in an environment and in a climate system that they are not able to keep up with. Um, and so it's our job to provide them with the most resilient habitats they, that we possibly can so that they can weather the storm. Thank you. So we're getting pretty close to our allotted Q&A time. So I'm going to ask uh, one of the questions and then 
we can always come back to the other two questions we had planned for the discussion if we don't have a lot of Q&A questions. Uh, so that being, how can our viewers, first of all, follow updates on the avian research happening at Audubon and advocacy happening at Audubon? And also how can they get involved both with Audubon's efforts and out on their own, um, get involved as in help with these issues? Um, Priscilla, you wanna go first? Sure. Um, well, first to start, um, sign up for Eagle Eye, our advocacy alerts. So you can stay abreast on our advocacy initiatives and also throughout the legislative session that will um, start in early January, uh, we'll be keeping you informed on how our priorities are doing and also where you can weigh in, um, whether it is by contacting um, elected officials and letting them know that you support a certain piece of legislation. And I will say what also goes a long way is having these conversations around why um, our initiatives are, are important um, to addressing climate change, protecting birds, protecting pollinators. Um, one of the things that we saw was very effective in helping to support the passage of the Octane Climate was mobilizing Rhode Islanders and offering opportunities for engagement, whether it was a civic training or an advocacy training. Um, so we'll continue to keep you informed on what those opportunities of engagement are um, and where you can amplify our, our efforts. Um, and I think that will continue to have a big impact. Like Charles mentioned, really engaging um, the general public um, and auto, you know, you all as Audubon members and supporters, I think plays a, makes a very big difference um, when we're at the state house pushing for policy solutions. Um, you know, elected officials um, are elected. They want to hear from constituents. Um, so when you say you support something, um, it really goes a long way. Yeah, and I'll just echo, um, you know, I've been maintaining a blog since I started at Audubon. Um, uh, and so that is one tool of communication that I've been using to convey the work that I've been doing. Um, and in addition to that, uh, there's a newsletter that I'll be sending out once a month that outlines the work to date that has been done, tidbits of information from the region, as well as globally in terms of avian conservation issues that we're facing, uh, and also volunteer opportunities that are coming up. Uh, as you might imagine, this type of research is going to be re heavily reliant on volunteer data, much the same way that the Bird Atlas was. And so I, 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 I encourage you to sign up to receive those newsletters. Uh, you can go on to the Audubon's website and click on blog, read one of the blog posts, and at the bottom, it allows you to, to sign up for the newsletter, uh, and then you'll become um, vested as a, as, a, as a newsletter receiver, so you'll, you'll get all of the information. My sincere hope is that this is not the last town hall. I want, uh, I want us to do this again. I understand there's something like 60 people here tonight. I would love to do it again and have 120, and then again after that with 300, and I want to keep this groundswell to the point where where we get a lot of Rhode Islanders passionate about conservation to the point where they're interested enough to tune into these and, and ask the very important questions like, what can we do to help? I'm with Charles, I second that. I'm excited about future town halls and continuing the conversation with you all. And I think it's great to um, hear your input, your thoughts and ideas, especially as we're working on the ground, whether it is on, on research or policy. Um, and also the idea of hearing from, from other voices at Audubon. And, and, and so you have that insight as to how we're all working together um, to, to, work, to fulfill Audubon's mission. So I'm really excited about that idea. And I hope you are too. I agree. We'll definitely do more of these and definitely a little bit longer because <laughs> we have so much good content for you. Um, okay, so we're gonna answer a few questions that have gone into the chat. Uh, I'm just gonna go in order uh, that they came. So Lindsay asked if there is a map depicting the 9,500 acres of land Audubon holds. Is this all of New England or Rhode Island? I don't know, um, maybe Charles, if you wanna take that. Yeah, I'll just, um, so uh, no, there isn't, uh, largely due to the fact that a lot of the parcels that, that Audubon manages are, are not uh, public parcels, you know, they're easements 
for example. And so if you collectively add all of the, the property that we manage as a, as a organization, there are over 9,500 acres of it. What you'll find online, for example, are uh, maps that show you where the publicly accessible refuges are, most of which have trail systems. Um, and so a lot of these parcels that we manage are, are not accessible to the public. They don't have trail systems in place, but they do have habitat that requires a certain amount of management. And so uh, that map is not available, but to answer your second part of your question, uh, yes, with the exception of one refuge, all of that 9,500 acres exists in the state of Rhode Island. This is not all throughout um, uh, the, the region. So we do, we do protect a lot of land here in our tiny ocean state. So next question from the chat. Um, Lindsay also said that many people are not aware of pollinators and what they do and how critical they are to our health and planet. And we definitely agree. We're trying to educate people more on that and um, getting involved with the advocacy will help spread the word. So. Um, so next question is playing devil's advocate. If a legislator asked you, why are you so concerned about birds and what would what would be so harmful if we lose some birds? <laughs> How could you ask a question like that? <laughs> uh, Priscilla, would you like for me to go first on this or? Um, go for it. Oh my gosh. How could I even answer that? Because birds are awesome because uh, uh, because they're amazing and, and they're everywhere and they've they've in 160 million years, they've managed to fill our entire planet and and they've done that and they've slid into all of these ecological roles playing these these incredibly important roles in the in the ecosystems in which they occur. I, I liken it to so so Paul Ehrlich is a classic ecologist who who wrote a, a paper, I believe it was in the 1970s, where he likened all the biodiversity to uh, an airplane, a metal airplane with rivets all in its wings, right? And so through time, uh, because of extinction, because of hunting pressure, habitat loss, uh, you can lose some of these species. And so a couple of the rivets from the wings of the plane might disappear and they might pop off the plane. However, that plane is still able to remain airborne. But should you lose enough of those rivets or particularly important rivets, then the entire plane crashes. Uh, and that's how you have to think about biodiversity. Everything is here because it, it serves a purpose. It plays a role, right? There is this incredible interconnectedness in nature between everything, not just the birds, but the birds, the habitats they live in, the, the resources they require for food, for nesting, um, the mammals and reptiles that like to eat those birds, everything is connected. And so if you pull one thing, you find that it is linked to everything else. Um, so it would be, you know, the, the idea of coming up with uh, ecosystem, uh, ecosystem worth. So what is an ecosystem worth? What are the players in that ecosystem worth is a fairly easy thing to do to define the actual roles an organism plays within an ecosystem in terms of its ability to pollinate, for example, um, in the case of hummingbirds, if you're talking about birds specifically. Um, but birds are important because they serve a very specific role in the habitat in which they are found. And without them, that habitat would not function correctly. And the, the habitat is required to provide us uh, with the resources that we, we require to, to survive and to thrive on this planet. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Priscilla. That's a tough I'll question add, to answer. I'll add something. Go ahead, Larry. I mean, I don't think that people truly appreciate, or maybe not, maybe this crowd does, but certainly a lot of people don't appreciate the ecological services that birds do provide. Um, one good example is um, the use of birds in California for uh, pest control. Organic wines out there, um, they'll put bluebird boxes in between the rows to um, lessen the, the, the insects, and they save a lot of money and um, help you know, reduce the use of pesticides. So you know, that's one concrete example, and you think about if it weren't for swallows and bluebirds and that kind of thing, how many more mosquitoes and black flies there would be. So even at a, you know, small selfish level, um, birds are important. And I'll just quickly add, a, I think a more sort of simplistic response um, to a legislator um, 
I think absolutely we should go into all the things that Charles went into. I, I think it's really important to talk about the intersection of of these issues, right? We're we're not just talking about um, one species. We're talking about the entire ecosystem. Um, and I think another the, another um, addition to that to that eloquent response is um, science is also telling us that's what's happening to birds and wildlife and different species is happening to humans. So if birds cannot adapt to a rapidly changing climate, a warming climate, then that's an indicator of where we're headed. You know, also as a human species. So we have to make sure that. Um, we are also keeping that in mind um, that w- this is all interconnected um, and birds are being impacted, people are being impacted, and those impacts are happening right now. Um, so we're very vulnerable as, as the ocean state. Um, and also one of the other things that, I, that I'll say that we get as um, that we often hear from legislators is like, well, Rhode Island is so small. Like what impact can you actually have in addressing the climate crisis? And it's like, well, you know, our small smallness is our asset. We have to position ourselves as a leader in addressing the climate crisis. And it's a sum of, uh, it's a sum of all these moving parts. So we need all states, we need all countries to take an active role in addressing the climate crisis. And we play a very critical role from my perspective um, and from an advocacy standpoint, um, you know, and, and looking our our composition as a state, it's very interesting where we have 400 miles of coastline. And then like Charles said, we have over 50% of our land is forest land. So I think we could be a really great example of how addressing the climate crisis can be done in both mitigating climate change and also adapting to this changing climate and investing in resiliency and how we can actually use it to have a thriving economy and really that we're creating the economy of the future. Um, and actually one of my um, peers, um, Sue Anderbaugh at the Nature Conservancy says that there's one economy, right? There's not just the blue, the green economy. We need to make sure that sustainability is across um, um, is woven into every single part of our economy. So I'll stop there because I can continue talking for hours. We'd love to hear more from you all. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, so we have one more question from the chat. Um, and like I said, we did kind of skip over a couple of our more distilled questions that came kind of from your the major themes that you sent in. So. I do apologize about that. This definitely was a learning uh, activity and we'll probably offer these a bit longer in the future. So that last question is, or next question is, what is Audubon Society of Rhode Island's land acquisition, if there is one program looking at in the future for securing lands in perpetuity? Is the TNC's resiliency tool part of that program? I'll lead off. So, okay. Yeah. Well, 95%, if not more, the land that Audubon owns and protects was donated properties. They came to us uh, over the years, starting in 1923, right on through uh, to the present day. And we, um, we, I'd say Audubon was the only game in town. We were the only organization around that people could look to, to try to protect land. These are very generous conservation-minded people. In the meantime, um, kind of starting in the late 1980s and 90s, um, Audubon would then, you know, uh, seek funds through the state or the Nature Conservancy um, and try to purchase some critical pieces, generally where the state and the Nature Conservancy and Audubon all saw eye to eye on what pieces were the most effective to purchase and maybe most under threat. And generally the um, the strategy, at least you know, in the past 20 years that I've been with Audubon, has been to try to build upon the blocks that we've already protected, rather than trying to get various little fragments. Uh, that just seemed to be the most cost-effective way to do this. I think going forward, I'm really excited to take a look at you know, the kind of data that will come from this research so that we can really see the roles that certain refuges might have with certain species. And one that may come to mind would be Parker Woodland, um, where how important it is for wood thrush. And in that, you know, we kind of take Parker Woodland for granted almost because it was donated to us back in 1941. 
Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of agencies would see that, well, it's just oak woods, uh, big deal. You don't see a lot of diversity. You don't see any rare habitats or rare plants necessarily, but there are a few. Uh, but taking a look at places like Parker or Epley or Fisherville or some of the others and saying, well, these particular parcels are extremely important for these responsibility birds or the ones that are in decline or the ones that where it's a key uh, migratory stopover area for something like the Canada warbler that's got to make its all the way to Canada. Okay, what properties like those can also be um, secured? And again, in order to do this, it takes fundraising and maybe getting allied groups like the state open space or the Nature Conservancy or other foundations to see eye to eye with us and uh, prioritize those kind of properties. I was going to say pretty much the same thing. Uh, you know, part of the work that I've done to date has been identifying what habitats we have and uh, the proportion of that habitat in terms of its representation across our refuge network relative to the proportion of that habitat type in the state as a whole. So we understand now that which habitats we are conserving, uh, which species are likely to be using that habitat, and then which habitat types uh, should the opportunity arise would be uh, beneficial to to go after to conserve because there are species associated with them that we're not currently protecting with the with the parcels that we have. So all of the information coming in from the science uh, work that's being done is going to feed into that pipeline so that we can better manage what we do have and make more responsible choices in the future about what parcels would be worth looking into uh, for their conservation value, not just from a land perspective, but from the species that use that proper, that habitat site. And Audubon has this particular focus with birds. It goes with the name, right? Uh, whereas many land trusts um, have various different other um, responsibilities for agriculture or recreation. Uh, the state government, you know, has to look at multiple uses for recreation, hunting, uh, you know, as well as wildlife or whatever. So having this focus, I think, would really give Audubon that kind of edge in identifying for and lobbying for uh, certain habitats that birds will need. Well, thank you, everyone. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We're supposed to go till seven and we're just about there. So um, we, I, I guess I'll let Larry say uh, any closing remarks if you'd like. And um, yeah, we, we received a great amount of questions and they were all a little bit more specific than, you know, what we talked about today. So um, Jeff did drop in Priscilla and Charles's email address. You are welcome to contact them and hopefully we hold more of these in the future so we can really get into detail with some of these issues. But thank you everyone for coming. This is great. Yeah, okay. So finally, I do wanna say thank you. Um, with our audience, it almost feels like we're preaching to the choir because you are the true believers. Uh, but I'll tell you, one way that you can continue to, you know, keep in touch, maybe sign up to help volunteer with some of the monitoring that may happen or speaking out to your local legislator. And of course, you know, uh, Audubon runs on money. So we can always use your donations, especially at year end. So uh, don't forget that part. Uh, without you, without our supporters, um, we wouldn't be able to do the kind of work we do. So you are really uh, the folks we work for. So. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all. Have a great night, everyone. Have a good night. Have a good night.